thank you all for joining us for live Q&A and office hours with Dr. Kyla McMullen. This session is a follow-up to Dr. McMullen's video recording using data to customize the 3D audio experience that you've already watched. I'm honored to introduce my colleague, Romesa, who will introduce Associate Professor McMullen. Romesa, take it away. Uh, once again, Dr. Kada McMullen earned her Bachelor of, of, of Science in Computer Science from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, UMBC, where she was also a Meyerhoff Scholar. She earned her Master's and PhD degrees in Computer Science and Engineering from the University of Michigan between 2010 and 2012. While earning her PhD, she was also a faculty member at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan. At Wayne State University, she taught computer literacy courses to over 2,000 students. Dr. McMillan is the first and currently the only woman of color to earn a PhD in computer science and engineering from the University of Michigan. She is currently a tenured faculty member in the University of Florida's Computer Information Sciences Engineering Department. Dr. McMillan has a, has a personal commitment to encouraging women and minorities to pursue careers in competing and other STEM fields. She is the author of Beautiful Black and Brainy and Brilliant is the New Black, which showcases hundreds of exceptional young African Americans who excel in STEM fields and don't fit the typical scientist stereotype. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ramesa. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And I know uh, our speaker has a, has a special connection to Turkey, where Ramesa is from. Uh, so uh, it, it's very special for you to do that for us. So thank you, Ramesa. All right, so why don't we jump right in? Uh, Let's so do it. Uh, we've got a group of people here in the room uh, who have watched your video. We're excited to jump into some questions. But for the people who are not in this room who haven't seen it, you know, can you give us the cliff notes? Can you explain what cliff notes are? Because I don't think yes. cliff notes are. <laughs> cliff yeah. notes. So there's this thing that used to exist called books, and people read them. And you, you know, let's say you have a really long book and cliff notes were basically like the cheat sheet for getting around a book, reading a whole book. It gave you basically the summary. It's like when you go on Wikipedia after you watch a movie and it just gives you the whole summary of the movie and you, you save two hours, you know, you can just read a 30 minute summary. So cliff notes are intended to, I, have no, I don't know who cliff is, maybe they're Clifford notes now, they've evolved, but um, cliff notes are basically like a small condensed version. So for my talk, um, so my work is in 3D audio, in virtual reality and augmented reality. So um, one thing that we use this for, well, first, let's even talk about what those words mean. So um, we're familiar with VR, where you put on a headset and there's two different eyepieces. And as you look through, there's two slightly different images and your brain combines them to give you this uh, feeling of just being in a 3D or a virtual space. So there's a similar concept with making really 3D sounding environments. So getting that sound, not like you're listening to just like a song over your iPhone, but like things actually are coming from locations in your environment. So the same way that uh, sound travels in the air, we can mimic how that happens. Um, there's like a small time delay. So if there's a sound that's, let's say off to, you know, my right here, um, this, my right ear gets it a lot quicker than my left ear, not a whole lot, fractions of seconds quicker, but enough that our brain notices. And then the sound that is, uh, you know, closer is also a fraction louder. Then there's some head shadowing of different frequencies that my head does. So all of these things play a part into how our brains are wired to know where things are coming from. So we basically can just use signal processing to mimic that. So we do that in virtual environments. And as you can imagine, everyone has a different internal mapping of how their brain interprets where things are because we have different physical proportions. So part of my research is about uh, doing acoustic experiments or psychoacoustic experiments, which is basically how we think about sound to figure out, okay, how can we, even though we differ so much, how can we make or figure out a way that everybody gets a really good sense of 3D sound? So that's the perceptual part of my work, making sure that um, the 3D sound that you're getting is what the person who created it intended it to sound like. And then the other part is applications, like, okay, now that we have it, 
decent, let's throw it into some systems. So how can we use 3D audio in augmented reality? How can we use it in context where there's a search and rescue and a person's not able to see? Visually impaired populations can also be helped by this because they, you know, they aren't able to see, but you can orient and cue people with these sorts of sounds. So um, there's another uh, fraction of my work that deals with putting 3D audio into first responder um, situations so that if let's say a firefighter is in a building and they're not able to see or the site or there's it's smoky and vision is a little occluded, they already have helmets on. So building 3D audio into the headphones that are already or the speakers already in their helmets so that they can um, get the heat signature in the room and know where things are and be able to navigate towards them. So um, that's pretty much the gist of it. The, the filter that I keep talking about um, of filtering sound through so that it sounds like it's in 3D that's called an HRTF or a head related transfer function. And that is basically how sound changes in the air because of your head. <laughs> so that's like the big, uh, that's why it's called head related because it's literally because of your head, your torso too. But uh, yeah, so we can, we can talk more about that. And if we get questions that I didn't cover in this uh, Cliff Notes version, you know, I can explain a bit more. Fantastic. Uh, so why don't we we jump into the the meat of your presentation? So uh, we I, I have some questions um, that we pulled together, and then we do have some audience members that have uh, questions for you as well. Uh, but can we start out by finding out how you found your way? Uh, how, what kindled your interest in the interplay of sounds and virtual reality? Oh, definitely. I knew nothing about it before I went to grad school. So um, my dissertation advisor actually was the person who introduced me to this area of research. Uh, originally, when I started in grad school, I wanted to do something that had to do with educational technology. And that just didn't work out for uh, a number of reasons. And um, my advisor at the time, who uh, helped me finish my educational technology project and said, oh, actually, I have some projects in my lab, if you're interested in hearing about them and um, he uh, he was working on lots of different things that had to do with sound. One of them was an early version version of Shazam. So uh, doing like basically looking at like pitch distance, but being able to let people be able to hum a melody and then you can figure it out. And so one version of Shazam. The second was uh, three this three D audio, and I forget what the third was, but he was like, okay, these are the things that I'm working on. Pick what you want. And the, the moment that he described. 3D audio. I was like, that sounds like magic. And if you know anything about me, I love magic. <laughs> I've always loved magic. And computers were like magic to me. So I'm like, oh, more magic. And like, you know, he let me listen on his uh, computer. And he's like, you know, these are some of the sounds. And this is how, and I'm looking at how he's literally just coding numbers. And I'm hearing something over here. And he's pressing a button in MATLAB. And something happens over there. And I'm like, oh, I got to figure out what he's doing. I need to know this magic trick. So um, his work was more so um, on the signal process processing side. So his PhD, he has two PhDs, one in electrical engineering and one in, um, in experimental psychology. So uh, blending those two together, he was very much concerned about the perceptual aspects, um, the psychoacoustics parts. I was more so about, okay, this is cool, but who can use it? So I was more concentrating on the applied part. So that was the way that I kind of pivoted away from his research area once I joined the faculty. But um, but we definitely complement each other because every time there's a new paper, he's like, did you see this? Did you see this filter? Did you see this effect? And he'll send me something. I'm like, ooh, let's start using that. And so, uh, but yeah, it was definitely my dissertation advisor, Dr. Gregory Wakefield. He actually just retired uh, this semester. So, uh, but yeah. Did he retire because he's getting a third PhD? <laughs> I know, so right? I, I, do I don't put most. it past them. Goodness gracious. Three I don't PhDs. put it past them. And he was Daddy Warbucks and Annie. He also sang, like he did a lot. <laughs> like the like the like the broad <laughs> Oh no, no, no. Well with the, the performing arts department had like a university production of goodness. Annie. And but still, like all those were her and what is it, Pirates of Pizzance? He was yes. also in that. Like he was definitely still a performer and just super smart person. And one thing I really liked about him was that he never made anyone feel stupid because he really could with two PhDs. He actually did the opposite. He made you feel as though you were just as smart as him. So he he always thought, he's like, oh, you got it. It's just A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm like, hold on, like, let me write all of this. Yeah, A, a B, B, C, D. <laughs> <laughs> let me write all of this down. And, yeah, and I'm like literally writing down words to Google at the end of every it's single It's so interesting. Part. 
that um, that a person who is artistic chose to study sound. Yeah, that's it's so incredible. And I, I don't know if other people have this experience, but so many people in this space, um, in, in the academic space, play instruments or dance. You know, there's just there's so much uh, creativity in the space. And that's what I, I love. I know one of our first conversations, I mentioned a, 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 a common uh, story we talk about in the privacy space where, um, you know, there's a bunch of people at a conference. I don't know if this is true or not. This is like the whole. And then I woke up and my kidney was gone, probably. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people at a privacy conference and they're just like, OK, we want to identify where this audio is coming from, from this video. And ultimately, the person who figured it out could hear a train in the background mm. and they were crossing the um, the slats that you the train goes across and mm -hmm. apparently the distance between them is different in Japan so oh. the noise it makes is slightly different than anywhere else in the world wow and so they wrote the pinpoint it was like it was like two people sitting on a bench that's so you know, crazy. eating ice cream or something so I don't know wow. if this is true but you know um, <laughs> I can see that happening all right, you know, see? Okay, I can see I, that happening all right, maybe. Okay, cool. Uh, so um, uh, we have another question um, that, that goes a little deeper into your work. So uh, with an immersive 3D sound, can the graphic interface compensate for sound uh, action confirmation or is sound unique in this aspect? Oh, absolutely. Um, it can definitely compensate for um, action confirmation. That's actually one of the biggest uses of sound in the interface that we don't actually pay attention to. Uh, sometimes if, you, if your system isn't on mute, you know, we have a sound that says, okay, you've put something in the trash, confirmed, you sent an email, confirmed. So like um, with the immersive sound, with the GUI, uh, asking can the graphic interface compensate I would say the graphic interface by itself, um, you can get visually overloaded because there's so many processes happening at the same time on your computer. So um, without more context um, with this question, I think this person's asking, can we just use visuals for action confirmation, but that's the equivalent of having a thousand pop-ups versus um, because visually you can only pay attention to whatever you're facing and usually you're facing and you know it's very constrained and if you're doing some other task having all of these pop-ups is kind of intrusive but when you're listening it's not as intrusive you can have background ambient things that um, don't take up as much time and space and just mental cycles to perceive and know what's happening like you can hear the timer and not have to completely turn your attention away from what you're doing to to take notice of it the same way you have to visually move your eyes to something else to in order to pay attention to it so um, i would argue that sound is actually the way to deliver lots of information without overtaxing or overburdening someone before we jump into hrtfs i have another question so mm -hmm. while using a digital filter to process sound in a live acoustic environment how does the filter keep up when there's going to be like a slight delay while processing? That's a good question. So it's frame rate. It's a, so how do I describe this? So in, when you're uh, processing in real time, so um, let's imagine that we have a sound that I'm going to give a really low, I'm trying to give a really low level uh, version of this. So just think about it as like a black box. This filter is a black box. You put sound in, it does this magic, sound comes out. So let's say that you're live and someone's turning, they're moving, there's lots of dynamics. Um, when you're using a digital sound, the good thing about that is that you take small pieces of the sound and put it through the box. So if it needs to be very dynamic, you take smaller and smaller pieces and then you're constantly resampling the position to be able to um, say, you know, take small piece output position X, small piece position Y so that it can keep up. Um, if the um, sample rate is too high or if the, sorry, the size of the amounts of samples that you're getting is too high, then you'll start to get this lag. You'll, it'll be really, really slow. So that's one of the trade-offs too. You need to have a pretty fast processor that can not only um, filter really small things really quickly because it's doing this one process over and over and uh, DSP has definitely digital signal processing has evolved because we get smaller and smaller chips so we can make more powerful and powerful devices where before you know you would need a whole computer for this but um, right now we have a version that can do this on the Raspberry Pi 
it gets hot, but <laughs> it's on the raspberry pie. Uh, we have the four core, the quad core raspberry pie that can, uh, you know, filter in real time as a person moves um, and be able to basically take in location information and orientation information. And at the same time, and sometimes we just drop some, we're like, okay, if we're backlogged, you know, drop a couple frames and we're going to just keep up and just update it. That's something that programmatically you have to, um, you know, just program into it and just have uh, sort of a queue. But if the queue gets it's too long of things that need to get played just drop some things so you can jump up and be current and it kind of just happens seamlessly behind the scenes because if you're taking really small and small chunks of a very large sound then it just blends people don't really you can't really tell the difference all right so i have uh one more one more question uh and then we're going to uh, turn it over to our participants so participants if you have questions start getting your hands up uh, so it's uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a two I guess it's kind of a three part question on HR uh, TFs. Okay. Uh, so why do people pick the HR TFs that exceed their measured HR TFs, and then what explains this gap in measurement? So that's the one that's the two part question. Then the next part is what's your vision for people using your HR TF database? Oh, definitely. Okay, I love these kinds of questions. Okay, um, I will first start with some context for that question. So there was an experiment that I talked about in the paper where just to refresh, um, we wanted to figure out if a person could pick a good HRTF just by listening instead of us having to physically measure how sound impacts their ears or how sound reaches their ear canals. And that's like a whole lengthy procedure where a person has to sit in an anechoic environment. They have microphones in their ears. You play sounds at different locations, record it. And then um, you have to, uh, you know, basically create a filter from that. So instead of doing that, um, we wanted to see, hey, instead of um, trying to create one for a person, can I just um, let them listen to sounds created from this database of already existing filters, and can they pick the one that gives them the best uh, sound image? So um, what we found in that paper was, yes, they definitely can. So the, the question here is, why do people pick HRTFs that exceed their measured HRTFs? Um, I gave the analogy of, um, of picking an item of clothing, like having one that's tailored towards you and all of your proportions, putting it on a hanger and then having a bunch of just generic sizes from, you know, that exceed and don't, you know, from different proportions, you might pick two or three things on the rack that, um, that you feel like fit you, but you may not actually, you may pick those in addition to the one that was actually made for you. So people may want a different sound experience than what was naturally, what would be naturally measured for them. So, um, since it's very subjective, um, people just may have a different preference. So that's why they may pick um, other things. We also aren't really, uh, we're not used to picking uh, 3D sounds that match what our brain and ears naturally do together. So this is also a very new task. So we're not tightly tuned into that. So we're basically asking, hey, which one of these sounds the most like when your brain hears a sound right here? Like it's a kind of complex question. Um, and so I think that's where the gap in the measurement comes from, mostly uh, preference in the sound. Uh, the vision for the database, we want to make sure that um, we get the data out there. So in our database, we not only have we have head scans of each user um, you can create measurements of all different parts of their heads using the head scan we have a generated head related transfer function so we just want other researchers to use it and to be able to collaborate and um, just like just to collaborate and get more information from this so we can get more understanding about um, what's affected. We're trying to use some machine learning models to figure out, okay, what if we just scan a person's head and we know the HRTF, the measured one for a bunch of other people, can we just deduce it without a person even having to tell us anything? Um, can we just figure out what parts of the ear and what parts of the ear canal and the head and the torso and all of that uh, contribute to it? So it's about information, research, collaboration, because a whole lot is unknown in this area. Fantastic. Uh, so before we jump into our questions, which would be uh, Rumesa, Imani, and Christina. Kevin, are you out there? Can you turn your camera on, please? Kevin. Kevin. So Kevin, Kevin, uh, can be a, please turn on your camera. Thank you. Can you spotlight him for me, please, Merlin? 
So everyone, Kevin um, uh, is the person I referenced earlier, had an internship lined up in DC. And, uh, and uh, there's been some changes and some policies. So folks have lost internships who are not American citizens. Oh, so no. I'd, uh, so within the last two weeks before the Institute started, Kevin jumped in. Kevin wrote all five of the questions I just read. <laughs> I love it. Kevin is a legal studies major. Interesting. Ke <laughs> Kevin, is, Kevin is brilliant. And I just, I want to say that publicly, Kevin, you are brilliant. You are a deeply cerebral and kind person. And our institute would not be the same without the amazing questions that you've come up with. I am sh shocked at the way that you pull questions across every topic. I am just, I'm in awe of you. That's Again, amazing. if anyone was blown away by those questions, I read word for word what Kevin wrote. I word thought Kevin word. had worked in the area. I was like, whoever no, wrote these? Kevin is a legal <laughs> studies major. He is deeply, deeply brilliant. Yeah, these right? are spot on. These are really All good. right, Kevin, you can turn your camera off now. Like little hugs, <laughs> Kevin, 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 Kevin. All right. So I, I got to do that. I got to embarrass him every once in a while. He's also the only uh, man in my research lab. Oh, wow. Yep. He's, he's, he's a special dude. All right. Um, and everybody is saying the same thing, Kevin. They've been great questions. All right. So let's jump right in. Rumesa, go ahead. First question. Yeah, I definitely admit that these questions were brilliant because like, to be honest, after watching your video, I was feeling like, oh, this is just so cool, but this is much more about natural science, but I'm, I'm on the line of this, like this, this spectrum of the social science. But I'm just wondering about these applications of your, your ideas, uh, which, which applications of your ideas excites you, you, you find exciting much more? Maybe oh, I'm that's hard to pick. Maybe it's like maybe I can understand what you are doing much more. Actually, <laughs> this is the way I find that. Yeah, I, it's really hard to pick, but I do think the experiments around the first responder work are really exciting. I have two students that are helping in that effort, and one of them is looking at um, how do we actually in the real world respond to sound because so much of how we perform experiments is very sterile, very clinical, um, but that's not how the real world is. So we're looking at the impacts of noise and interruption and things like that. So that's really exciting to me because no one's looking at that. And then I have another student who's working on, um, who's taking a kind of a divergence from the field and saying, okay, great. HRTFs, measuring it, that's how you get the exact uh, measurement. But what if people would perform better with an exaggerated HRTF? So we're looking at some things that aren't naturally uh, achievable in the real world. Like your head would have to be a really weird shape in order to get that filter. And like you would have to have these weird contortions, but people seem to perform better. So we're like, where is this coming from? So we're looking at like ways to make the sound cues uh, different, but not compromise performance. So I really like that part of the first responder work a lot. Um, yeah, those are two exciting parts, but everything, I'm, I'm excited about all the work. <laughs> Imani is up next, Professor Munyaka. Oh, wait, you're still muted, Imani. Okay, thank you. My there. question is, um, was actually the same as what Mesa had asked about, um, but I, was, I wanted to know about like, where do you apply the preferred measurement versus like um, what you've actually, or the preferred HITF versus what you measure? Like where are those numbers uh, most important? So that's what I was gonna ask. And based on off of your answer, it seems like that would be for, uh, in the emer for emergency services or? It depends. So you mean like, when do we actually use their measured filter versus some other like approximated filter? I guess I'm wondering like, okay, if y'all found out that people perform better when they like are using these, the ones that they prefer, but I'm wondering like, where would you then apply that next? Oh, so, like, oh, oh. I guess I'm just trying to figure out like, cause if you already have the measurement, I guess what I'm not understanding is like, why, why do we care about what users prefer? Right, that's the issue. We don't already have the measurements. Uh, we oh, don't have okay. a measurement facility. So there's just like a very few amount, a small amount of measurement facilities and they cost like a million dollars to make and the setup is ridiculous. So lots of people um, publish, actually UCSD, uh, a lot of them publish the results from um, their measurement facilities 
and that's how other researchers can actually do research on it. So um, we, the way we were able to measure is um, I have a collaborator at NYU and we were able to use this uh, system called HeadZap that's specifically made, but it's also really expensive too. So um, there's a huge cost to getting these individualized things. So we're like, all right, imagine that you don't have all of this money, but you can afford a MATLAB program. You can afford, you know, this program to run this, uh, to run this code. So it's, it's basically cost because because not everyone has access to the huge uh, anechoic chamber with the tra trapeze floor, basically. Like you have to cover every single surface in the room that could possibly give some sort of like reflection or reverberation. Like it's, it's pretty intense. Like you can't even have AC in the room because it'll make noise. Like there's, it's a lot that goes into constructing these rooms. Thank you. All right, make your question debut. Christina Lee, please join us. Hi there. Um, so I'm curious about one of the things we've been talking about in the past week and a half or so is how important it is to ensure that you are being inclusive with regards to data collection. And I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about, I'm thinking about those meshes, right? Like these kind of models of people's heads. And at that stage in the data collection, how how do y'all account for like the various ways that people's heads look, the types of hair that people have? I was curious to hear more about that. And then secondly, with regards to some of the work that you've done, like in terms of having a podcast, right? This is work that's often not recognized as a part of like the tenure track docket, right? Like that's something completely different oftentimes. Can you talk about whether that work that you've done has been recognized as a part of your work as a professor and how you managed to kind of integrate that into your own practice as an educator? Well, those are good questions, Christina. Okay, so I'll start with the first one about inclusivity um, in terms of the measurements. Yes, we definitely try to take strides to make sure that we're not including or excluding, we're not excluding anyone because of uh, their hair or their head shape or anything like that. We actually have a, um, I won't go into that project. We have another one that has more issues with hair, but uh, for this one, we ask people to, if they have hair, <laughs> to put it into um, a ponytail or get it as tight to their scalp as they can. Most of the time, just because of who signs up for the experiment, it's mostly white males. Um, if we do have women, usually, you know, they'll put their hair in a ponytail. When I do it, it just depends on what day it is. I tell my students, if I can't do the experiment, given whatever hair I have that day, we need to fix something. So. Um, and also another assumption of our system that's currently in is that all of the, everything that's within the head scan is a rigid structure. So we know that our hair is not made out of iron. So we have to get the hair as far back away from the ears as possible so that it's not interfering as much with the measurement. So um, yeah, it's, it's, we have to do a little, do a little creative creativity there and getting the swim cap, I think was our way to kind of just standardize, you know, the head shape. But um, we also did some thinking like, okay, well, when you get a haircut and when you change your hair, do you all of a sudden lose the ability to hear? or Do you hear things differently? And the answer is usually no. So, you know, unless you have something that's like covering your ears or really obstructing your ears. So we, you know, really thought about it. And we're like, I don't think hair really uh, plays such a big part. And we have, a colleague who looks at the effects of glasses and other things on your face um, and how that impacts the HRTF and like basically doing a because he has access to one of these rooms so he measures a person with their glasses on gets their filter measures them without their glasses on gets their filter has them listen to a bunch of different sounds rendered over um, both of them at random they don't know which one is and there it turned out there was no preference for with or without the glasses. So we're thinking perhaps the same can be true about hair. I know that's a really good question. Um, and then the second about the podcast, academia does not care. <laughs> they do not care. Um, they care when they're getting money and uh, they care when they're getting money. So the way that the podcast initially started, um, NCWIT, which is the National Center for Women in Information, Information Technology, uh, they needed a, a make good. <laughs> 
<laughs> for how uh, Black women were not being served by the organization. We uh, collaborated with them through IMCS to um, come up with this podcast to highlight Black women in computing. Now, they gave the gift to the university, which then came to us to be able to create this podcast. But there's a ton of red tape around it. People don't actually understand that model of, I don't know, it's just, it's ridiculous. Like you need a production assistant, you need all of these different things to make a podcast work, but it was really difficult to get people paid and to get guests on. And it was just, it just became really, really cumbersome. And at the end of the day, you have three buckets that you have to fill in order to, um, to get tenure or that you're evaluated by. It's research, teaching, and service. So at R1 universities, roughly 60-ish percent uh, research, 30-ish percent teaching and the rest service. But service is basically, you can fill that by doing a science fair judging for one afternoon, or you can have an entire summer camp. But guess what? Both of you get that same check mark for service. So um, there is no degree of service the same way it is for, um, for research. There is no going above and beyond. There is no numeric value like grant dollars. They're just like, oh, great, you're doing stuff. Oh, you did a lot of stuff. You're still getting that same check mark. It's not like you get extra credit for doing more. Um, We've since moved it outside of the university because uh, it is, um, they were basically being enemies of progress. It was really hard to get anything done. Um, so now we're a 501c3 and we're able to do the things that we need to do. Our funders are able to still fund us and things are, are going well. Yeah, that's my favorite phrase when instead of calling people enemies of progress when I can't yeah, figure that, it out. That's going to end up on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> staff, let's make sure we grab that one. Yes, right, feel so, free so, to use it. <laughs> So uh, I'm going to I'm going to um, have uh, Andrea join us uh, on uh, on camera and uh, we'll, she'll ask a question. I want to mention one thing. You got a shout out from Brandeis Marshall last night. She was like, if you oh, all haven't yay! heard the podcast, you need to hear the podcast. So, nice. uh, so you are in this space, even if you are not present and you have awesome. been omnipresent. Thank you so much for your willingness to be here for both a lunchtime talk and as a well, guest speaker and then also on our panel, one of our panels. So thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Go ahead. Take it away. So uh, official congratulations to you about um, <laughs> your associate professorship. Um, so um, I, I work at the University of the District of Columbia and we have, we work with um, Homeland Security a lot. Mm -hmm. and we actually um, have developed, um, me and a colleague of mine developed a simulation for OSHA to get OSHA certificates to students who are, are doing that. And one of the things that the simulation um, showed was visuals and they had headsets on and things like that. And what dawned on me as I was sitting here is that um, just like you said, in emergency situations, it's not just visuals that you have, it's sound. And so I'm wondering um, if there's any, if you've talked to the folks at OSHA, if there's any application of kind of what you're doing in that space, because they're always training people about how to avoid hazards and things like that. And it just dawned on me that it might be something that um, you would explore and would be interested in. Yeah, it's definitely something I would be interested in studying. I just know from prior experience, I've been a little reluctant to uh, like things like the it also applies to the Air Force and the Navy. And like, um, I'll just give one example. Uh, when I was in grad school, my advisor had a contract with um, the Naval Research Lab and I actually went for the summer. We did all of these really cool experiments where we were using 3D audio for their sonar operators to be able to detect where things were underwater and basically did a one-to-one -one comparison of their current training and then using our system and our system blew them out of the water. And then they shut the program down. <laughs> So, yeah, so that was a uh, very interesting and I didn't have high enough clearance to know why at the time, but what was communicated to me many years after the fact basically was that um, oftentimes programs are slow moving ships. So even if you can show that um, something is better, it's going to take so much more training and research and reskilling that um, they'd rather 
just not <laughs> like if it's a, if it ain't broke don't fix it kind of thing and not spend the money changing it versus just uh, or if it does get changed it'll be further down the line so I was definitely burned by that project where I'm like you know what I don't want to do a bunch of work and it not be actually put into so I'm thinking I thought that was where I was going to end up after my PhD like working at NRL and continuing this kind of thing and I'm like well if you see that something's clearly better and then you just close your eyes <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? So I was like, that might infuriate me. And then I had a friend at a, another government site who actually left and went to Google because he had similar issues, another DOD sort of thing where um, they would make all of these solutions and they ask them for all these product features and things. They do all these testings and then it would just sit on a shelf and no one would use it. So um, yeah. Another I, enemy of progress. Another <laughs> enemy of progress, yes. And I, I have a follow-up question on that before we go to Imani. So in those situations, do you have a patent on those things or can your, or can what you've come up with be used, I don't know, 10 years from after it's discussed? Oh, that's a good question. So no, we don't have a patent because we did talk about um, mm. getting some of the parts patent, but it's more so the application of something versus the technology itself. So my advisor at the time, you know, did not think that that what we were doing, that real time rendering like that this he's like, it's the algorithms published in the book. All we've done is implement it and, you know, apply it in this way. Like there wasn't enough novelty for it to be a patent. But I'm like, it's novel that we're putting it over here. You know, it's in this. So, you know, I was a, you know, budding grad student. I wasn't really like and I'm like, oh, if you're, you said you're an enough, associate then... professor now. I think you should go yeah. get those patents for things that you've created. Because, you know, you don't yeah. want it to appear somewhere that's not your intention or you have someone. I mean, I think about Watson Crick, uh, who got the, 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 was it the Nobel Prize for the double helix when actually the work was done by a woman, mm. um, you know, and I, I'm forgetting her name. She passed away before. Uh, and that tells you something. I'm forgetting her name. Uh, she wow. passed away before they got it. Uh, so I would say, you know, especially in spaces where you're creating something that's novel and someone's like, oh, we'll leave that till later. Patent it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I signed something that said it belongs to them mm -hmm. <laughs> when I went to work for the summer. I'm pretty sure I signed something that said, and it's fine, you know, because we were doing lots of experiments and I thought it was, you know, it's, it's a learning lesson. It's uh, we have Very true. other copyrights and patents, so it's not Ooh. something that you this know. has copyrights and patents. I want to hear about yeah. that, but let's get Imani to jump in with her question first. Yes. But I would love to hear about uh, what you have uh, patented and such and copyrighted. Imani, go ahead. Uh, so I kind of had um, two questions. One was I did want to hear a little bit more about how you are dealing with the issue of hair. Um, I was just mm -hmm. curious as to what y'all were doing, and the second one was. Um, I don't deal with sound data at all. So I'm wondering, are is there any like privacy impl implications that you have to um, keep in mind as you're collecting this, this type of data? Good question. So um, first with hair, it's kind of on a as it comes basis. And you know the population of UF. Most people have straight hair that can be pulled back relatively easy. Um, one person in the lab now has locks. So she can like pull hers back or pull it up. And we can also just snap it out of the, uh, the mesh, like everything above her hair. So there is a bit of just like getting the hair out of your face. Or for example, if you have a fro like Nanette, like we don't have to move anything because <laughs> you know your hair is right there. So it's just a matter of like, if your hair is movable, putting it behind your face and ho hopefully on top of your head so we can just like clip it out of the mesh um, and just going like that because not everyone can use the swim caps um, in an effective way because then you get these scans or people have these lumps and we have to do like some smoothing as well so there's a little bit of artistry as well there but um, yeah it's a case-by-case -case kind of basis you know there was someone who showed up with like a whole lot of hair <laughs> my uh, student was like I don't know what to do, <laughs> but he did have like, we have a whole clip of like, you know, just ponytail holders in the lab just for people who come and do the experiments. We just give him a ponytail holder. So he was able to, you know, to get it up. And it was, I, I need to get some wider ones because he had some hair. <laughs> like it was... They're the soul, the soul caps now for, for those. Oh, who that's it. right. Yeah, you can get some soul caps, maybe soul caps can sponsor your research. Hey, I need to put that in the budget. They're going to be <laughs> like, why is there a line item for soul caps? <laughs> hey, I love it. I, I'm, I'm going to look into that. Look into that. Seriously. Yeah. 
So, okay, so um, uh, let's- uh, so The privacy go. part of her question, I wanted to- Oh, yes, go too. ahead, please. So um, with sound data, we're not recording any sound from them, so there wouldn't be any um, identifying information there, but specifically the head scans, yes, because that can be identifying in the future. <laughs> I don't think, because um, it's basically stored as a mesh cloud, so it's you know just a series of points, but if someone were to hack in, get the points, graph them in 3D space, you could just kind of have a outline of a person. Um, I don't know if there's any privacy around people's meshes, um, but that's basically, actually now that I think about it, that is how some of the facial recognition camera software works by looking at you know the different locations of points. We might be able to open up their cameras. Uh, <laughs> so we do have them sign stuff that says that we won't do anything evil with it. But you just gave me something to think. Well, let's let's talk about that. We need to figure out some stuff because that is a yeah. We're not evil. Our slogan is to do no evil. <laughs> but uh, but yes, we're um. I definitely have to think about um. I'll I'll chat with my lab about that. That's going to be something we chat about on Tuesday it's about what privacy issues, if any, um, we have. Like we might try to use the point cloud to open up someone's phone just to verify that we can't. <laughs> Amber's going to hop in next with a question. Go ahead, Amber. Okay. Hi, Dr. McMullen. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared so far. You're doing so much. So one of my questions is how do you balance all of these different commitments from your podcast to the mentoring to finding mentors for yourself and to teaching? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm a proponent of scheduling and blocking and boxing. Like, um, at the beginning of each semester, I do basically a semester plan of what I want to achieve. And then I put everything into like uh, really small digestible pieces. Like if I want to, if, let's say if I need to get two papers out and a grant that semester, I break them down into their smallest possible units, down to the lit review, down to the section. And it takes a really long time. Like I take about two days to do that at the beginning of each semester. Um, and then um, I map it out that way. And then like I map it to weeks, I make it really realistic. Like if I know I'm going out of town, I don't put boxes on that week. Or um, if I know that, you know, there's a conference or something I wanna do, I also have um, a dead week, one in the middle and one at the end, just in case there's any catch up. Um, but like in the beginning of the week, let's say that I have 19 boxes and 15 slots that things can go into, then that means I have to prioritize now. I need to take four things off that either can be delegated. I'm really good at delegating, asking other people to do things. I look at it and say, what, which of these don't require a PhD to do? Um, I also have a, I use this service called Fancy Hands. It's like a personal assistant service where it just does things that are really mundane tasks, like there's just so much stuff that's just paperwork, just busy things. So the stuff that I can kind of just pass to them to do, I do. Um, I, I'm all about hiring help, getting help with the podcast. All I have to do is sit down and record and send an email asking people to be on the show. And then once that, once we finish recording, the sound files are in the cloud. Our editor gets them. The editor gives them to our social media manager and she schedules and puts them up. I might give her an idea for an episode name, but that, you know, I'm totally hands off and I like to get things um, in systems so that I don't need to, uh, to actually touch it. Um, and I've actually, you know, our social media person has been my own personal content coach because um, she's all about people, especially Black women, getting the information out there about what we do. And some of the things that she really talks about is like repurposing, like everything's content basically and repurposing what you're doing. So if you're putting a lot of effort into something, sharing it in multiple places because not everyone is on every platform. Um, so that's one thing that I really got from her. Um, for academics, Twitter, academic Twitter is lit. It's great. <laughs> there's so much there. Um, there's highs, there's lows, there's drama. It's great. But uh, um, I would say being a part of conversations that are happening in your field or even having Twitter chats, those are the ways now, the way networking used to be at conferences. I would argue that being a part of the Twitter conversation around a topic can just posture you as an expert a lot faster than a talk can. And also you get to like, you know, you sit down, you have 
have Google, you can look at things, you can appear very, very bright. You know, you can also schedule things to go out. So if you're like, I don't like social media, it's a waste of time, et cetera, it definitely is. So you can schedule things to go out and they'll look like, you know, you put them out at whatever set time you want it to. You can sit down and have, you know, this is the hour that I think about social media, schedule things to go out. There's a free one called Contentino. There's a free service that'll um, schedule and it's Contentino with a K. Um, we used to use that before we got our, um, our manager, but um, it'll schedule things to go out on lots of different platforms, uh, putting things on LinkedIn, making sure your LinkedIn is up to date, um, make yourself stalkable. <laughs> <laughs> is what I like to tell students. Uh, if you need, if you want to find me, you can find the information. And it's not just so people can get in touch, but it's also important that people know what you are known for and what you can do, um, because people always want to reach out and if they need something or a speaker or a guest or a panelist, and you're basically helping them to. Um, you're getting rid of some of their workload by doing that. But I know it's there's a huge push to be very. You can be private, but also stop. You don't have to reveal everything about yourself, but you can also you can reveal your thoughts about certain issues. So there's a way to be private, to talk a lot, but not reveal a lot. <laughs> I like the <laughs> make yourself stockable. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to add, uh, Susanna's going to jump in in a second, but I'm hoping you can talk a little bit about, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the name right now, but there's the graduate diversity website for future for faculty. Oh, yes. Can you talk uh, a Carrie little bit Ann about Rockmore. That? Yeah, and I always mess up the acronym. I think yeah, it's so NCFDD. F NCFDD. Yes. yes, and it is org, I believe. If you don't do anything else, and you know what, I want to even backtrack where I um for for the question that you asked, this is where I got all of that strategy from, and um it's called National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity. It was developed by Carrie Ann Rockmore, who um was a faculty member. In, was it Chicago? I forget where you Chicago maybe. Um, I can't remember. It's not important, but she was able to retire from the faculty by putting on these sorts of uh, workshops and talks and oh she that's right she has retired <laughs> since she's not old <laughs> she's uh, she's been able to make this a very profitable sort of thing because she got this uh, I like strategies she got this whole faculty thing down to a science and she has this boot camp that's 16 weeks and it aligns with your academic schedule I did that my first um yeah, my first semester as a um, new faculty member because I had two friends who had already done it and they were like, whatever startup money you got, this is your first investment in yourself. You need to do this. And um, you get uh, it's 16 weeks of content and everything is relevant to that week. It doesn't really matter what university or school if you're on the quarter system, it just kind of works. And you start off every semester has a plan is the first meeting. And I revisit that all the time whenever I'm doing my semester meeting. You have accountability groups where you meet, I think, once a week um, on a mutually agreed upon time. Everyone's in different areas, so there's no like risk of stuff getting out in your research area or someone scooping your work. Um, I've still carried on a lot of that because all of my friends who were in her program, we do the semester plan, <laughs> you know, with each other at the beginning of you know fall, winter, and summer. I'm oh, sorry, fall, spring, and summer. I still call it the spring winter because of Michigan. <laughs> fall, spring, and summer. Um, but it's amazing. She really has a way of making you focus on what is going to move the bar in terms of your tenure and promotion. So basically turning your expectations on their head. So not thinking, oh, not opening your email and letting your computer tell you what you need to do. Thinking about how am I going to be evaluated and structuring your, um, your day that way. So when I said, oh, I need to prioritize because I have more tasks than time, I'm looking at, okay, what are all the research things? Boom. What are the teaching things? And, you know, teaching is a little more immediate because you see the kids all the time. So I'm like, what are these things? We'll make sure that the, that the class is not on fire. <laughs> Good. And then the service stuff fills in the rest of it. So and also um, that isn't to say that I don't have fun things on my schedule. My fun things are non-negotiable on the schedule. So when I'm pulling things in and trying to fit stuff, it's because, you know, I have a dance class on the schedule. I have a massage on the schedule already. And, you know, I'm filling in the work part, but still making sure I'm a human first. So that was a very long answer to a small question. But, uh, but yeah. And a lot of universities have um... Uh, subscriptions to NCFDD. So I know mm -hmm. Berkeley does. So all of the graduate students at Berkeley can use the site for free. 
yeah. you can do a login and there's videos and live things and you just I, I still keep in touch with a lot of my writing buddies from the summer right now oh yeah uh, I that's do right. it as often as I can it's an inc incredible resource yeah so I, again, I wrote eight papers do it. <laughs> the semester I did the first semester I did I wrote eight papers in one year <laughs> <laughs> in what? one year it but luckily it was the semester after my phd so i just had a lot of data that i just needed to get out because i got a bunch of results and like inst and it was close to dissertation so i'm like i'm just gonna put all this in my dissertation and we will publish on the back end so i just had this backlog of stuff and i was just churning this is, stuff this out is what i need to hear because this is where i am right now i have yeah. i have like and years worth of data and I just need papers to drop, 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 drop. Yes, so I'm telling you. I needed to hear that. I broke everything up and I got to the end. I think I was telling you, I told uh, Carrie Yank, because she'll give you her phone number you know, when she was doing the classes or stuff. I got and her I, number. Yeah. Yes. And she's like, call me if you need anything. I was like, and she tells you to put two buffer weeks at the end. I kind of modified that. I put one in the middle and one at the end, but having two buffer weeks definitely helps. And I got to the end. I was like, Carrie Yank, I have a buffer week but I don't need it. What, what am I supposed to do? And she was like, we are Americans have conditioned ourselves to think that we have to constantly be working. She was like, take a break. <laughs> Go sit down, take a break. Like, take a break. Who thought of that? <laughs> exactly. And, uh, and, like, and talk break. about people who are incredible <laughs> entrepreneurs. Look at Carrie Ann Rockmore. Uh, yes. So we've invited her to speak, but like I said, she is retired. She is, yeah. She's she retired. Is. She only takes on things that you know that that speak to her, and this speaks to her. So she does advise me. She's wonderful. Uh, so That's let's awesome. have Susanna jump in for our last question. Uh, well, you already um, or started touching on that because before you um, talk about the um, I also the faculty diversity. Thing because it has a huge name and I always mess yes. up. Yes. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you um, regarding your strategy for getting tenure, whether you got a mentor, whether you have a specific strategy. So I'm, I'm wondering now that you mentioned the faculty diversity, if um, anything else besides that that you did um, to devise a plan for yes, getting tenure. Yes, absolutely. I would say um, if you can get your hands on the a blank copy of the tenure document, um, just so you can know what you need to fill out. Um, one of the things that um, I was doing the projects, but I needed the research narrative. And so I had to pull together um, some sort of disparate pieces, like I had some work with BCI, I had some education stuff going on, I had the 3D audio stuff going on, but they asked for one research narrative. So um, for me, I was going towards what is going to get me funding, because I know that is necessary. So I had lots of projects in different areas, but some they were they were disparate. So if I went back, I would say, you know, this is excellent for structuring, but in terms of devising your plan, try to make sure that like, all of your research fits under one umbrella. Cause I'm just like, squirrel, there's a project. I like that, I wanna do it. So <laughs> try to make sure that like plan your narrative in advance. Like, of course you can't plan the outcomes of your research, but try to make sure that there's a consistent theme and a consistent story. So that when you're writing the research narrative part of your um, tenure dossier, it, everything looks logical. It's like, oh, okay, I can follow this person's work. I see how A leads to B. You might even have to make up how A leads to B. You know, some stuff happens in high Hindsight, and you're like, oh, okay, all of this is kind of the same thing because I planned it that way. <laughs> just try to, you know, you might have to reverse engineer the story, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. My uh, dissertation advisor was the one who was like, he said he's called it a, being a spinmeister is like another academic uh, trait, being able to uh, spin a story, even though that's not the way it, it initially started. Um, that was one. The second is knowing who your recommenders can be. I had already started developing my list of recommenders in my third year because I had a conversation with the dean and she told me to I did not know we could only have full professors so I had been cultivating relationships with people who didn't have full yet so that um, I had to basically not <laughs> use half of my list so um, having some asterisk people who were like uh, I think you're good or it was just a little stressful so making sure that there are full professors in your area that you seek out and they know your work and you know if you're at conferences or if you let's say use a technique that's in one of their papers or just anything that's kind of related that you try to keep them updated and then like once it comes time to and they know why you're doing it you know but it's one of those I want to keep you updated and then send them your highlight reel 
um, before it's time for the letter. Send them, hey, just in case, you know, blah, blah, blah. Would you be, it's kind of like when you're an undergrad and you want a letter of recommendation for an internship, you ask a person, can you write me a strong letter of recommendation? Another, I would be delighted if you could write a positive letter towards, you know, attaining tenure. By the way, I've done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that, because once you pull all of those things out for them, they don't need to read your packet. <laughs> so you've given them the highlight reel. They don't have to watch all the game footage. So you've made their job easier as well. And also you've told your story for them. So, you know, that's another um, strategy I would definitely say. Uh, knowing what's in the packet, um, the narrative developments, the recommenders. Um, what else? What else? What else? Minimize. I was just talking to my friend about this today. He he's uh, in his he's going up for his third year review at Penn, and he has what did he say? It's a ridiculous number, like 50 something talks just this year. <laughs> and he's like, he's doing really cool research in leukemia. He has like really good um, results. Like he was working in the lab, um, like a really famous lab. So he has a lot of work going on. And um, people always ask him to talk about it because he's really, really personable. And I was telling him the, you know, the whole overflowing buckets <laughs> thing where, you know, you're basically just filling a bucket that's already full. So, you know, you, you got to stop self-included. <laughs> so uh, we were talking about that actually right before this, but um, I forgot where I was going. But yeah, service, making sure you're not doing a bunch of talks. There's a space for talks, but then it starts to become alarming if it's like, why do you have so many talks, you know, and why? And also being careful of what talks you actually accept. Because if you start to, and because many of, you know, we're women, most of us, or person of color, blah, blah, blah. If you have lots of talks that look like they're geared towards service and not as much your uh, research, that starts to raise a red flag to say, okay, are you only focused on that or are you, can you do both? So that's another um, another thing to look out for. Um, I in I think in 2019 or 2020, I started rejecting talks if they didn't have anything to do with my research. They never asked about it and that worked fine. Or if I didn't even get to put like half of my research in there. So um, that was how I kind of got around that. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, for an incredible talk, uh, ranging from your research uh, all the way through to your um, your trajectory, how you've gotten to where you are, and we are, I feel so fortunate to be with you in this space as you achieve another great milestone tenure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for picking us this year. Yes, uh, amongst, yeah, absolutely. Uh, your list. And twice, you picked us twice. Yeah, because so. I get to talk about my work. I get to talk about VR and the metaverse. Like, this is technical stuff, but I get to pull the cultural part in. Like, this is the, the dream combination of the passions. Thank you for joining us, Professor McMullen. Thank you all for watching. For more information on six Howard Mathematica, visit our website, follow us on social media, and join our email list.